How's everybody doing? <laughs> Man, I'm excited. If you got your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 15. I'm only moving this because I'm uncoordinated and I'll fall. All right. Man, I tell you what. I, you know, I was just telling somebody, um, you know, as we were um, coming in this morning, uh, some of the anchors and, and the leaders and uh, uh, people that are serving here. You know, it's interesting, and, and I really... It really hit me this week in a in a week where I, it was kind of an exhausting week, but during in the in the last eight months, I, we've had more people um, give their lives to Jesus, recommit their lives to following Jesus in the last eight months probably than we have in the last few years, which is crazy considering eight months has been this season or whatever, I mean, we, since March or whatever, I mean, not eight months, but like, you know, that includes all of this craziness that is 2020. Um, and God has been so faithful in the midst of our weakness. Like, God's not stopped. In fact, He's like, you know what, I'm going to show these people, I'm going to put on the gas pedal. So, man, I, you know, I was thinking about the Rise service and some of the things that, that happened, and even with, with Kaylee, uh, who was the first person that was baptized, who kind of got this thing rolling, because we weren't really... You know, it was kind of on the bubble whether or not we would do baptisms or we were going to wait until the spring. You know, you're still worried about coronavirus even though you're outside and all that stuff. And we're just like, man, we're doing this thing. Um, but just her story and her talking about, the, you know, I didn't want this. This, is, this wasn't the, the thing that I, I wanted. Like, I don't even know how I ended up here. But if you talk to her, you don't have a more passionate person about the Word of God, getting to know Jesus more and more emotionally just broken down in joy that Jesus found her. Um, and when I think about what we're called to do, and we see that, that video, and you see, you know, I want Gerald to just read scripture to me all the time, you know? Like, can he just wake me up in the morning? Derek, it's time to get up. You know, that would be just so nice. And his voice great. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, everything he reads, I'm like, man, I would buy that. Just put it on tape, whatever it is. Blah, 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 blah. I'll be good. Uh, but Really just looking at that, going, this, is, this really is what, what God's called us to. Very simple, clear, one singular purpose, one singular focus. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter, actually if you go back to, to 1 through 11, like Dan said a couple weeks ago, it really is the depth of the gospel. Like he's making sure we understand the distance in which God had to come to come rescue us because we didn't want it. We were rebels. And then all of a sudden, the Apostle Paul makes this turn in Romans chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, where he says, this is, this is the, these, these are the implications. This is what could happen in your life. And specifically in 15, he's talking about the unity in the church, but he's more talking also about the one singular reason that you don't want to be distracted by the stuff that's going on in the world. Like, he's even telling them in this passage, like, hey, there's a reason that I can't come hang out with you all the time, because I have one job. You had one job. That's all he is doing. And he's doing that to bring clarity, not just to, to, to talk about himself, but to bring clarity about what everybody else should be doing as a result of this, this atom bomb of grace that's inside of their heart. We've received something, and now there's this explosion of movement outward. And there certainly was in the Apostle Paul's time. It wasn't easy, but man, it was moving so fast. And I think this morning, the good news is, is what the Apostle Paul's doing is something so different than the world that we live in, but there's something that's possible that we can execute while we're here on, on earth. Because there's some, some questions that are always in the mix. For everybody in the room, and in philosophy, you know, over the ages, like, you know, there's the big questions like, you know, where did we come from? You know, why am I here? And where am I going? You know, what's going to happen after all of this? But we're in the middle. So the why am I here is the one that's probably the most pertinent for right now. Like, what am I doing? What's my purpose? You know, what, what am I supposed to be doing while I'm here on planet Earth? What's the job? Like, everybody wants to know what they're supposed to be doing. What is my passion? What is my purpose? And am I good at anything? And is there anything, is there any legacy that I can leave? Is there any imprint? Can my life count for what matters most? Can I have a life that matters? Can I not just be stuck in the QB doing whatever for Jim Bob over here, handing in TBS reports? Is there anything that I could do here on planet Earth that will make a difference? And what's beautiful about the kingdom of God, what's beautiful about the gospel is that Jesus doesn't come to just rescue us and save us. He paid it all, rescued us, and did something extraordinary. But he's also inviting us in to something. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, we say it in here all the time. We've received this amazing news. Like God has loved us, poured his love on us. We've received the ministry of reconciliation. We were created by and for God. We're now reconnected with God when we follow Jesus. But then he says, guess what? You get to take this gift, just like these baskets. We get to take this ministry of reconciliation to the world around us. Not as this job, but as our ambition, as the thing, the one singular purpose, and the one singular focus. It's interesting, in the culture that we're in, there's a guy named Timothy Lear. He's kind of weird. He's a Harvard psychologist, um, semi-famous. Um, he says, right now, in the world that we live in, the difficulty in finding your passion or finding the thing that you're supposed to be doing is that we, have, we are paralyzed by the vertigo of freedom. Though you are free, because there are so many choices, we don't know what to choose, you know, i.e. Netflix or anything else. But he says it's the same way with passion. Like back in the day, you know, a thousand years ago, I mean, you, you know, you grew up in this family, farmer, you know, blacksmith. That's just who, what you were going to be. And you really got really good at what you did, and you weren't really that worried about it. Like there was that choice was made for you. Right now it's like, we get to follow our dreams, you know, whatever. I don't even know why I did this right here. It just seemed right. But you know what I'm saying? That's the, the, it's like follow your dreams, follow your heart, make sure that you do what, you know, what's inside of you. Every one of you is created uniquely. You've got this thing that's inside of you. You, should, you shouldn't do anything else. You should find what that is and then follow it with relentless pursuit. That's what, what you should do. And Timothy Leary says, yeah, that's great. That sounds great up here. But when you get down to it, that's not everybody's life. In fact, it's difficult to find. It's difficult to get in that place and realize, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? And what's amazing is that Paul was not paralyzed. You know why? Although he was free, he made himself a slave to one thing, to one thing. He had one singular ambition. And if you, if you pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago, um, as Dan was talking about the unity of the church and not getting distracted by anything, but being singularly focused on the gospel, he continues to talk about himself, not to brag about himself, but to say, hey, this is what I'm doing, and this is how I'm doing it. Not that everybody's supposed to do it like I'm doing it, but I have one job. I have one thing that I'm doing, one thing I'm ambitious about. And he says, I myself have convinced my brothers and sisters that you yourselves are full of goodness. Now, he's saying that because he's, he's corrected them a lot. In Romans, like, hey, I just want to tell you, number one, you know, Romans chapter one, you were all dirtbags when God found you. I mean, he goes right away. I mean, he's been saying some harsh things, but then he talks about the amazing nature of who God is. So now he's encouraging them, saying, hey, you're full of goodness. I know that. You're filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. You guys are ready for this mission. He says, yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. Because of the grace God gave me to be a minister. This is his one singular focus. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. So for us, that would be the lost. I mean, we are the Gentiles. We are the ones that are the glad recipients of Paul's church planting ministry outside of Jerusalem and Judea and the surrounding area. Saying, we're going to push beyond that. And that's why we're here. He says, we're bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. So that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That they would come home, that the rebels would come home. The ones outside of the kingdom of God would actually know Jesus and know, oh my goodness, this is what I was created for. And in verse 17, he says, Therefore I speak, therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. Like the one thing he's doing, his service to God, glorying in Christ Jesus. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished. I mean, that is a, you talk about a filter for our lives. Like his, his focus and what he's thinking, he's always thinking about, is this going to lead people to Jesus or lead people away? And so with his speech, with everything that he did, he thought, okay, am I leading people to the best news ever or am I leading them away from it or am I just doing nothing? Always doing that. He says, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. He's saying, there's stuff. God's going to come in and do amazing things. And you read the book of Acts. Man, God had done amazing things and was continuing to do it. So from Jerusalem all from Jerusalem all the way around to uh, Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been, listen, I love this word, ambition. That's a big buzzword right there. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. Now, if you think about it, it hadn't, 
he's speaking not of his entire life, because his ambition early on was what? To, he, well, his ambition was for God. But in that was to kill Christians because he thought they were pulling people away from the mission of God. But it's always been his ambition since he was reborn in Christ to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Now, some people will take that right there and say, why are we doing what we're doing here in America? Why aren't we all foreign missionaries? Why, aren't we, why are we building on other people's foundation? Why don't we have a bunch of separate solo missions all across the globe? Why are we all clumping and gathering and drinking lattes, singing worship music, and not going anywhere? Now, that would be a good challenge, but overly simplistic when we know exactly the context of how this passage is being laid out and what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. So rather, as it is written, and then he comes to this, the, the, he goes to the Old Testament and says, I want you to hear this. This is what we're doing. This is what I'm doing. Because this is what we want. Those who were not told about him will see. Eyes will be open. Just like Gerald was saying in the video, that people will see, that the light will come, that the darkness will leave. And those who have not heard will understand. One singular mission, one singular purpose. So I have three things that I want to draw out of this because I, I, I got so excited reading this passage because I wish I would have heard this years and years and years ago because I think I've, I've fumbled around with the idea of your calling, your passion, your purpose, your dream. What am I supposed to be doing with my life? I've fumbled around with that a lot. And not that I have all the answers, but I think the Apostle Paul leads us to a place where we can breathe. I mean, anybody feel that pressure ever? Like, am I doing anything that matters? I mean, I know there's all, people are on all different trajectories. Some people are in a job where they're doing something amazing. We got doctors in here. We got people that are, do amazing things in the medical industry, people that are teachers, people that are in you know, systems analytical work. We got engineers, people that I know that they, you love your job and you know what you're doing. But I know that there's a large portion of people that are in different positions, people that had an amazing job and now they've come home to be with their kids and their, their, their singular focus is different and, and it feels different. Or you've got people that have shifted into a job or you're in transition or you're just out of college. You're trying to figure out, how, what am I doing wandering around the world? Or you've gotten out of something that you were really good at and now you're kind of in the cubie, you know. You're in the, you know, the, the six by six cubicle, you know, with you know, RJ across the way that's just bothering you every day. You know what I'm saying? You're just in it. I mean, I don't know wh where you are, but I just feel like, man, this, this idea of passion and purpose and one singular focus can bring some relief as the Apostle Paul kind of breaks it down. So I have, I have three points. The first one is, you have one purpose, which we have say, said very clearly. You, you got one job. You know, as, as somebody that's received the ministry of reconciliation, as somebody that is a follower of Jesus, you, you, we're not just wandering around and going, man, I, I can't wait till it's all done. I mean, there's been a few times the last couple weeks, I got to be honest, I was like, Jesus, come now. But that God is, I mean, I think we've got this amazing time while we're exercising faith and this blip on the radar of our lives to leverage them and see something exponentially greater than we could possibly ask for or imagine with our lives. And we won't even know just the weight of that until we come face to face with Jesus and see the people around us that are affected by the gospel working in and through us. But you have one job, you have one thing that you're doing. In Romans 15, 21, he says, says this, I'll repeat it. Those who were not told about him will see. It's what we want. And those who have not heard will understand. You know, several years ago, I was, God had just done some really in incredible things in my life. Like, I, it took me a while. My wife, it was more of a, a transition where we were living life, doing our own thing. You know, church was part of it, but not, definitely wouldn't consider myself a Jesus follower. I mean, there's a difference between the quote unquote, I'm an American Christian and I, my life is all about Jesus, and I'm a Jesus follower. Like, he, what he says, what he's doing, what his word says, what he's asking me to do, that is at the top. That was not me. I was in control of my life, wanted to do what I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden, this transition happened with my wife. A couple years later, um, it had happened with me. And I was kind of just wide-eyed, looking at, like, what do I do now? You know? Like, what am I supposed to be doing? I didn't know. I was like, going to be a missionary, going to do this. What am I going to do? Going to go to the ministry? You know, am I going to be in secular world and leverage my job for whatever it is for the kingdom of God? And, you know, I mean, I was telling everybody about Jesus, amazing time, but misdirected energy, you know, in that, in that, in that weird space. Like, you know, what do I do? And I remember um, watching this. It, it was a, a, 
I don't know if it was a DVD or if it was a VHS tape. It might have been. No, I think it was an actual DVD. It was a, it was a DVD, which those are almost gone now. And I feel old, old, old. Um, but it was uh, of John Piper at uh, Passion One Day, uh, Shelby Farms, Tennessee. Um, it, was, it was raining, you know, 40,000 college students there. And I was really passionate about uh, student ministry at the time. I was already working in student ministry um, and would be uh, transitioning into working with college students. And he was speaking to a group of college students about this very topic. And about, you know, what you got one job. Like, there's one thing that actually matters in life. And he's speaking to them and saying, hey, you don't have to be the person with the highest IQ. You don't have to be the one that can do all these amazing things. You don't have to be the one with the biggest brain. You don't have to be the most beautiful. You don't have to be the one with the most money. You don't, th- those things are not required. I want to tell you, if you want your life to count, and he begins to jump into this line of thinking. I'll read this. I was going to have it all on the screen, but there's a lot that I want to read. And just, just hang with me. He says, there are hundreds of you. There was thousands. He says, there's hundreds of you. Who don't care whether, don't even care whether you make a lasting difference for something great. So he wanted to address the people that didn't give a rip. He says, you know, you want people to like you. That's your most important thing. You want people um, who would just, you know, be happy around you. You want to be satisfied in life, you know. Or if you could just have a good job, a good wife, a couple of kids, nice car, long weekends, few good friends. Sounds kind of fun, actually. A uh, few good friends, fun retirement. And that's, that's the, the, the allure, right? Fun retirement, quick and easy death and no hell. He says, if you could have that, you'd be satisfied, even satisfied without God. He says, that is a tragedy in the making. He said, three weeks ago, we got word at our church that Ruby Eliason and Laura Edwards had both been killed in Cameroon. Ruby was over 80, single all her life, and she poured it out for one great thing. To make Jesus Christ known among the unreached, the poor, and the sick. Laura was a widow, a medical doctor, pushing 80 years old and serving at Ruby's side in Cameroon. The brakes give way, over the cliff they go. They're gone, killed instantly. He asked at his church, and he's speaking to these college students, is that a tragedy? Is that a tragedy? He says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. He says, I'll read you something from Reader's Digest, what a tragedy is. Quote from the Reader's Digest article, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in, North, in the Northeast. Five years ago, he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler. They play softball and they're collecting shells. And you know what he says with a forceful voice? voice That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. He says, there's going to be a time in your life as a Christian where you're going to see and you're going to meet your maker, where you've you've transitioned in your life, you've taken the time, you've taken your resources, you've taken everything. And what are you going to say when you come before the creator of the universe? Here's my shell collection, God. Here's my swing in my front yard. Here's my boat. This is what I've got to show for my life. And I can't tell you that there are so many contemporary, famous, wonderful pastors that their life was changed on that field in Shelby Farms. And it, it ignited something that created some of the most mission-oriented churches in the United States of America in this short window of a talk that John Piper, full of the Holy Spirit, gave to a group of college students back in 2000. And it changed my life. It changed my life. It is our one singular focus, our one singular mission that we would give our lives away to Jesus. And the tragedy would be that we would miss it. That we would miss it in the, in the mix, in the vertigo of freedom to do what we want. Because we are free in Christ. You're not worried about, I mean, we're not in fear that God is going to come after us if we don't. Like Aaron said, Jesus paid it all. It is finished. It is done. We are free. But the Apostle Paul makes it so clear. He says, though I was free, there was something inside of me that said, no, I'm going to give myself to this. This grace that, that, was, that was in me, it also sustains me and it drives me, it motivates me to move out and bring the gift that I've been given to the world around me. It's the one thing that I'm doing. 
Now, I, I think the question that comes up, are we all supposed to be foreign missionaries? I mean, somebody might, might have just got excited, like, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to Cameroon. You know, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to give my life away. I want to be in that car. Thelma and Louise over the cliff, right? Not all of us are, we're all missionaries, but not all in the foreign mission field. And this passage isn't leading us all to be, I think it should inspire foreign missionaries. We're hoping to send some, you know, specifically from this church in the next year or two, which would be incredible. But we're all missionaries. I mean, you can see in Scripture, there was different, Paul had his job. He was the church planter. He was the one taking the, 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 the ministry of God to the Gentiles. He, he had a specific gifting. He had a specific calling in the way that he could do things. He, he was the one that, that would do well in front of kings, in front of leaders, in front of governors, in front of rulers. And Peter was the rock and the foundation of the church, building the church up, edifying the church, leading the church. He had a different job. And we know he stayed in his locality, in his local area. People have different areas in which they bring the ministry of God to the world around them. John Piper also says this, which should be challenging. There are, there are three categories of Christians in churches when it comes to the mission field, when it comes to missions, when it comes to carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. He says there's goers, there's senders, and then there's the disobedient. And man, that's a challenging thing. Just to even hear. But the, the good news for you and me is that no matter what you do, no matter how you live your life, no matter what God has called you to do, whether it's in, in, in the foreign mission field or right exactly where you are in the opportunities God's given you, it really, those things, there's not one that's valued over the other. A.W. Tozer says it this way. I love this. He says, The layman never need think of his humbler task as being inferior to that of his minister. Let every man abide in the calling wherein he is called. And his work will be sacred as the work of the ministry. It is not what a man, listen to this, it is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. The motive is everything. Let a man sanctify the Lord God in his heart. And he, listen to this, he can thereafter do no common act. There is some freedom in that, and that is born out of Scripture, and that is right, that turns the corner right into our second point. So the first one is, we've, had, we've got one singular focus, we've got one job, we've got one thing that we're doing. The second one is passion is wide open, but passion always bows to purpose. And I want to break that down, meaning passion is wide open. In other words, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it matters why you're doing it. But we always have to use the filter of when we're following our passions, when God is leading us to the places that, that, that bring our hearts to life, that we're leveraging it for one single purpose. Because in our flesh, in the war of our soul, we will use our passion. We will use the things that we're good at. We will use the things that we're curious about. We will use the things that we want to chase after. We will use those to satisfy our flesh, satisfy our ego, to make us look great. And he's, he's saying, in this passage in Scripture, I want to make... Jesus famous. I'm the one that wants to bow to the purpose of shining one beautiful, bright, big, massive light on Jesus. Who he is, what he's done. That people would know that nothing else rescues, nothing else redeems, and nothing else restores. So passion is wide open, but passion always bows to purpose. The Apostle Paul in Colossians would say it this way. He says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed... Do it, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I love that the word whatever's in there. It's just a good, it's just whatever. He puts it there for a reason. And you know what that whatever breaks down to in the Greek? Whatever. Whatever you do, there's such freedom in that. Like whatever you do in word or deed, it's anything, one singular purpose. God puts passions inside of you. God does things with people and, and ignites something inside of us that we lean towards. And, and it's amazing to, to look around and see how God uses and leverages people in every sphere, in every portion of life to bring glory to God. And we got some talented people in this church that, that have found their passion. Like I, they, they've, they've zeroed in on it. They, they've, they've kind of got, they're, they're in their zone. I mean, Aaron Walsh, who was just up here, he writes and plays music. Actually, he's got a kid's 
like Beastie Boys like kids album coming out. I mean, you might not think that's awesome, but I heard it. And if you heard a sampling of it, I, I shouldn't even say it. Am I, am I ruining the surprise? Yes, I'm ruining it. I was, I was almost asked him, like, can we play like a portion of it? Because it's so awesome. My, I th- Mike Berry's on it. Jonathan Tony sings on it. It's fantastic. Um, but, you know, writes and plays songs. I mean, Dan Trifoletti, I mean, he heals people's brains with a laser. I mean, people have got gifts in the church, right? There's people that have amazing things uh, in our church, Jonathan Tony has a podcast. He's an author. I mean, he would laugh. He's like, I do work in that six by six cubicle. I just want to be an author, and I try to be a podcaster. But we got people that are gifted and they are talented. But I, I think about this idea. I've heard this talk before. I've probably given it. But like this idea of leveraging your life, everything that you do, the amazing things that God's given you for, for what matters most. And somebody uses a tent like, look at Tim Tebow. He you know, played football, has this incre- incredible platform. He's this amazing stud athlete. He's so powerful and great. And look what he used. Look how he uses it. He uses it for the glory of God. But the reality is, is we're not all Tim Tebow. You know what I'm saying? You know, we're not. We don't all. We can't all get the laser and shoot it into somebody's brain and be successful at that and fix things. You know, I mean, we're, we're just not all Aaron Walsh. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? I think a lot of us are in that space. Like, what, what about just life? Like, I'm in the grind. I'm, I'm like, I'm not doing what I want to be doing. I'm not in that place of, of, you know, what is it? How do I discover, you know, what it is that I'm supposed to do? And I've got such good news. One, there's an amazing filter right here in this passage of, of you know, what we're doing. This idea that, that we are called. Our passion is wide open, but it is for one singular purpose. So we can ask this question. Like, as we're doing the things that we're doing. Because I would, I would venture to guess that everybody in the room is passionate about something. It may not be the dream or your job, but you get excited about certain things. I mean, my dad gets excited about certain types of gum. I mean, he's passionate about a lot of stuff. Like, he's like, hey, you got to buy that stuff. It's amazing. I mean, people get passionate. I mean, in, in this season of life, people, I've seen pe- people's passions rise. In an election year. In good, in good ways and bad ways. But this passage gives us a... A divining rod on how to navigate our passions. Like right, even right now in, this, in, the, in these moments. Like I said before, asking the question that the Apostle Paul would ask. Are my passions and the way that I'm expressing them and the things that I'm doing, are they leading people to Jesus? Are they doing nothing or are they leading people away? And that is a difficult question. When you, when you start to talk about people and their passion for politics, people with their passions about their ideology and what they believe and why they think about this, what they think about education, what they think about this, in every conversation, what is the Apostle Paul? I'm not going to speak of anything but this. He's saying, my filter is always going to wrap around this, this place. Is this leading people to Jesus? Is it doing nothing? Am I wasting my time? And am I distracted by something that won't matter in the end? Or am I, could I possibly be leading people away with my annoying personality? He's always asking that question. And we should always be asking that question about our passions, about those things. It, it will begin to narrow the focus of what we choose to do, what we get excited about, and the things that we do. I mean, I, I, I think the Apostle Paul is like, I could have, I mean, he was good at a lot. He says, I'm free from any and all men. But I make myself a slave to any and all that I might save some. So he obviously didn't do the things that he wanted to do all the time. I'm free to do them. There's no condemnation coming towards me. But I make myself a slave. To this person, I became this person. To this person, I, I came down and empathized with them. With the, with the really moral people, I could, I could definitely relate to them. I got on their level and I could talk to them. With the immoral people, I got on their level and I could extend myself to them. To this group, to this group. I didn't worry about who's on what side or what's happening. I got into that zone and I talked to them and I led them to Jesus. I I became all things to all people that I might save some. He had a beautiful filter that was singular focused. He knew that his passion would always bow to his one singular purpose. And I think sometimes we get wrapped up in our passion and we think it's got to be this obvious gifting. Like, that person is a painter, and no doubt. And there are people like that. There are people like Aaron Walsh, who's very gifted in music and, and writing songs. Or Dan Trifoletti's found his, his zone. But there's a lot of people that, are, that have distributed gifts, that have things, some and, and undiscovered things. Things that you haven't even figured out yet. Like, 
I, I don't know that, that most of the world is operating in the career that they're most passionate about. And sometimes it's just work. And I think the world puts a lot of pressure on us saying, your work should be your passion. If it's not, you should quit. But i got to make money. I mean, I think that's a problem in our culture. I think some people don't get jobs. They're just waiting for that train to go by that you know, says, hey, man, I am an underwater basket weaver, and that's what I do well. Haven't found that job yet, but I'm looking for it. Sometimes work and, and passions are, are distributed. Sometimes you have this job and you're passionate about something else. Aaron would say that. I mean, he, I'm, I'm sure he loves his job. There's aspects about his job in the, in the tech industry that he loves. But you, could, you could talk to him for 10 minutes and something's going to bleed over about his passion and it's going to have nothing to do with his job. I think we, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves when it comes to our passions and it's not necessarily your career that you're in. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem that you have something that you do throughout the day. You can become passionate about it, though. We have this idea of passion like this, this big thing. But our passion is so much more than that. And, you know, I was thinking about um, just seeing him, seeing him on stage. And I've been thinking about him this week because he's a, he's a good friend. And I've seen his life change over the last seven years. But Seth Johnson, like, this guy follows his passion. Now, he, he for a job, that joker, he... He fixes car interiors. And I mean, I think it's one of those things that you're like, how could you possibly get passionate about that? If you asked him, he'd say, it's very possible that I'm not. But if you, if you saw his Instagram, you would say, he's, he, he's, he's passionate about his job. He does excellent work. He, there's something about the way that he operates. But when I think about somebody living out their passion, I think about Seth Johnson. Not because I'm like, wow, car interiors. But here's why. I'll just give you a list of nine things why I think my man Seth is following his passion. One, he does amazing work when he's at his job. Despite not loving it all the time, he does amazing work. He uses his skills to bless people. If you know Seth Johnson, he's, he, he is the, I'll learn it on YouTube and I will, I will test it on your car. I mean, he is that guy and he's successful at it. And he blesses people. He takes his time and his energy. He takes his skills and the things. He's, he's, he's done interiors on my car before. He's amazing. He talks to people about Jesus when he's at work. He tells me about it, celebrates those things with me. He uses his commute because um, he travels a good way for his job to study the Bible. He jams for the lamb on his guitar. I mean, we heard it this morning. I mean, it's fantastic. He bugs me all the time about missions and caring for missionaries as our groundswell leader. You need that guy. You need the guy going, what are we doing right now for them? How are we caring for them because they're lonely? How are we supporting them? Because right now they feel very distributed. Everybody's kind of pulled off and made up, made, put, put the walls together and everybody's you know, protecting their nest eggs and doing all their things. Churches are kind of doing this and going, well, we just can't do anything. What are we doing? He's the bell ringer for missions in our church. He's unusually generous and open-handed with his time. I could tell you many stories, but the most recent one, like somebody came and visited our church um, a, a, Amazing, and, and, and had an amazing experience here. They were here because the Mayo Clinic's here. That happens often. We'll have somebody come by. Um, and they needed somewhere to stay for a little while when they came back down. And the Johnsons like, been to our church once. They said, you can stay at our house. You know, we got, they got kids. And, uh, I mean, and don't think you can just stay at the Johnsons house, by the way. I mean, they just don't call them as Hotel Johnson. But they, they said yes. And they stay, somebody stayed there for a month. They took care of him, had dinner with him, and, and I, I just, that is unbelievable, off the chart generosity. Uh, this unusual, generous, open handed with time thing, that's a passion. That is a gift. You don't look at, pa you look at passion as, I want to be a sculptor or a painter, but I'm not. Be generous. It's listed as a gift in the Bible. Generosity, open handedness. We need more of that. Unless I follow my dreams. It's incredible to watch somebody operate like that. And I have watched people in our church, Seth Johnson and many other people, follow their passions in the midst of faithfulness. And that was the, the, the place that they found it. I, I love this guy, Crawford Lourdes. He's in, he's in uh, Atlanta, pastor in Atlanta. He says, we get hung up on gifts and talents when all the while God is thinking about faithfulness. In the midst of faithfulness, I can, I've seen it over and over again. I've seen people discover their passions and find passions, and you realize that those are the, you're a passionate person. And you know what they're passionate about. They discover those things. Sometimes it's just the collection of your experiences. You wonder what you're passionate about. Sometimes it's the opposite of what you think. 
Every one of you is created uniquely by God. And your stories, good and bad, are a collection that is unique to you. Not only do you have unique DNA, but you, you and only you traveled your story. From the time you were born to the present. And there's a stack of things. There's good and there's bad. But the good news about who Jesus is, is he takes the bad and he leverages that too. He doesn't just take the good. He takes the bad stack and says, I'm going to show you how you can be passionate even about this. And I have seen it over and over again. I've seen it over and over again. You take a, 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 a young person that's, that's helping us in student ministry right now. Went through the, watch their parents go through this tragic, awful divorce. Guess, guess what they're passionate about? Man, when they hear about a kid that's going through it, that's divorced, immediately they're like, man, I'm, I'm in there. That's my heartbeat. I need to talk to them. The tragedy becomes this redemptive story, and it's beautiful. It becomes a part of their, their passionate life. For me, going through an undiagnosed neurological disorder seemed like the worst thing at the time. I was excited about Jesus. It put me on my back. I was depressed for three and a half years. But I found Jesus at the bottom of my, my, my pit. And I can't tell you, I was the person that did not like people that had weird things going on. Like, I don't know, I can't diagnose that. I, uh, you probably need to just you know, relax and you'll be fine. I was the worst. And then it was me. And the compassion God's given me for people that have dealt with anxiety, depression, with undiagnosed medical conditions, all of those things, has, is, is through the roof. Like I am, I have ministered to so many people in that particular area. Through my pain. My pain has become my passion. Do you know that the word passion actually means suffering? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? I think we have this distorted view of what, what our passions are supposed to be. But lastly, number three, collective passion is greater than solo passion. And man, this Romans chapter 15 is, is really what it's about. Dan touched on it a couple of weeks ago. But God designed the church to be a reflection of himself to the world, a spotlight revealing Christ to the world. If we go back in Romans chapter 15, it says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, our suffering Savior, his passion. So that with one, listen, with one mind, with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of your Lord Jesus Christ. With one mind, with one voice. You know, one of the most difficult things in the church and one of the most powerful things in the church is the diversity of the church. I mean, if we all thought the same thing, if we all, you know, felt the same way about every topic, if we all, you know, were, if we were all just the same, it would be a whole lot easier. But it wouldn't be nearly as beautiful and it certainly wouldn't be as powerful. God has brought us together as this beautiful collection of people. And he's weaving us together. And he's never meant us to be solo operators, ever. That has never been his intention. One voice, one heartbeat, one goal. Diverse in our passions. Coming together. Joining and uniting together. It's like taking a bunch of pin lights together. And all of a sudden you begin to collect them. And exponentially, the more you get together, that light gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. That one little, that you on your solo mission, you might accomplish something. And I hear people that are like, hey, don't mess with me. I know what my passion is. I, don't, I know what I'm doing. I, I got my thing. I've already got my outline. I got my, my deal. You could go fund me, but I really don't want any, you know, but he's speaking into that. I've, I've already made a decision about that. I've already fixed all the stuff. I've already got, I'm going, it's me, and I've got a guy I'm meeting over here, and we're going to do this thing. It really doesn't have to do with the church. I'd love the church to go in that with me, you know, in the, in the deal, but I don't really need the church. I really haven't been in church. Church hasn't done a lot for me. I want to do it on my own. You might have a little bit of impact, but my guess is you'll probably have zero impact. And had you taken that purpose out of the solo category and put it in the collective of the church, exponential power. Exponential power for so many different reasons. The authority that God creates in the church, it's God's engine and it's God's plan to take the church and, and its collective to shine a big, bright, beautiful light on himself so that people will know him. And you're it, it, doing it on, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the solo, I'm telling you, wasted energy. But the accountability, the love and encouragement that you'll get in the church. I mean, I think about it as a, like a team. Like I, Florida State Seminoles won, and gosh, it was just tough, but it was, they won. It was amazing. But over the years, people have kind of said, this is FSU's problem because they're, they're absolutely horrible. And this is why they've gone from dynasty to whatever. 
And her, Kirk Herbstreit wrote a, a great article about it, and I agreed with all of it. He just said, the team culture, it's a disaster. Everybody's playing for themselves, worried about their NFL career. I'm a solo operator. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing my, and then it's the, the backbiting and the, and the fighting on the team. Nobody's willing to say, I'll do whatever for the one goal. We want to win games. Put me wherever. I know this is the, the nice, cool position, but you can stick me over here. If it's going to make us win, that's what I want to do. Nobody was willing to do that. That's what you need. I mean, their biggest problem right, right now and has been in the past is blocking. It is not like the most glamorous deal, but you cannot win football games without a left tackle. Like everybody talks about the quarterback, the receivers, the running backs, and everybody's running down there, spiking the ball. You need a big dude that can stop this guy from destroying your quarterback. Protect the blind side. Not glamorous, but man, without it, the team is lost. We come together as a collective. It, it, it takes all of us together. It takes all of us together doing it. Church is a place you can grow. You can nurture and discover your gifts. You know, you, 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 you find out. You, some of you know your affinity, but some of you don't. I think about Mary Beth Dell that came in here years ago and didn't know what she, she came in here desperate for God. Like she didn't even know she was desperate. Wandering around trying to find this place, calling her mom, crying. Just in a bad, low place in life and just lost. I mean lost. Mary Beth would come up here and tell you herself, just lost. Came in here, God began to just absolutely disrupt her life, change her life. She filled out the leadership development program form to start a year-long, I'm going to give my life away and for free to the church, which I was kind of wary of. I'm like, this girl doesn't know what she's doing. She has never, doesn't even, she has no clue. But she just thought, I got it. I, I, I know, all I know is God's changed me, and here's me. I don't know what to do. Can I be in this deal? And we rolled the dice, and aren't we glad we did? Aren't we glad we did? Because she didn't even know the gifts that sit inside of, of, of Mary Beth. She didn't know what those were because of insecurities, because of a lot of stuff. But holy cow, I'm talking about a wrecking ball of passion. You talk about set the tone, one of our values. She is the queen. Like, you could take a horrible event that was not well planned. You stick Mary Beth in the middle of it, everybody will go, I don't know why that was awesome, but it was awesome. Because she just blows it up somehow. She discovered her passions. She just, she's discovering even now what she's good at. I mean, she, but would she say, nobody ever tells me how to do my job or the areas of weakness? I mean, she would say, yeah, I'm glad that's there too. I got people around me. You can discover it. I've seen it over and over and over again in the collective. The collective is always greater than the solo. Always. And when we think about Jesus, think about Jesus. You talk about passion and suffering. We hear that term, the passion of the Christ. You know, what does that mean? Well, that's, that's his passion. The thing that we remember, Jesus did so many amazing things on planet Earth. But the, the thing that we remember most, the thing that's reverberating up into this room right now from over 2,000 years ago, is the way that he gave his life away for you and me. His passion was to give away. And the Apostle Paul is saying, do, do the same thing. You want to be passionate about something? You want to care about something? Give your life away. That was Christ's passion. That was his suffering, was giving his life away, bleeding out on a cross for you and me, and being raised to life gloriously, and, and leading the captives out of the grave with him. You and me. And I don't know what it is that's stirring in your heart, maybe the existential crisis of, man, nothing on this planet has satisfied me. What am I supposed to do with myself? And I'm telling you right now, the truth is standing in this room, moving in this room, and his name is Jesus. He's calling you to follow him serve him. And I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. Let's stand. God, we love you. We love who you are, what you do for us. We love how you work in us. God, continue to, by the power of your spirit, quiet the noise of the distraction of the things that we think we want, that we think will save us, the things that we think are important, the things that we think deserve our passion. And direct our hearts towards you to experience your love, your mercy, your grace, your fulfillment, and your purpose.